So I thought today we'd start looking at this Cosmic Elf 2K. Uh, it was a kit I bought from uh, Spare Time Gizmos probably a decade ago. Uh, that got assembled to the point you see here. If I remember correctly, I powered it up the first time it didn't work and just never got back to it. Uh, I met Bob Armstrong in 2006 at Vintage Computer Fest down in Mountain Home. Great guy. Bought several of his kits. Uh, really enjoyed assembling them. Uh, I built another one of these which worked and I was happy with and built the little keyboard or the little switch panel assembly that went with it. Uh, I eventually sold that on eBay. This has been sitting in a box forever. So we've got the main processor board here with the 1802. It's an 1802CE chip. Uh, the TIL311 displays, these are, are hex displays, so they'll, they'll, they'll display uh, you know, 0 through F. Hex, uh, there's a 27, I believe 256. EEPROM here with the monitor ROM in it, a 256K SRAM sitting here. It's a 62256. Uh, a Dallas semiconductor. Actually, two Dallas chips, a 1210 and a 275, maybe. Uh, they had to do, I believe, with real time clock. There's, of course, the GAL that ties it all together and a little bit of TTL logic scattered around. Uh, Nice little kit. It's got a serial port for output. Uh, it can have composite video out if you've got the Pixie chip, the original uh, Cosmac Pixie chip. You could put it in here to produce uh, video. That chip uh, was used in a lot of the really early video games, or at least a number of them. Uh, it's a nice little kit. Uh, I don't have the Pixie chip. Instead, I've gone with a daughter board that Bob designed. Uh, you can see the construction here for the state it's in. Uh, I will probably, as my first troubleshooting step here, remove the socketed chip, supply power, and look at current draw. Oh, apologies for the noise in the background. Uh, it's the dryer telling me that the uh, dryer load's complete. Apologies. Uh, I'll probably reflow all these joints. They don't look that bad. Although there's a few that are very gray and ugly looking, like I say, I, I applied initial power. If I recall correctly, it didn't wake up. And I just never got back to it. Uh, takes in 9 volts DC. It's regulated down to 5 volts DC here. There's this little card here, which is the Pixie chip replacement. So this replaces that, that Pixie IC uh, that was part of it. Uh, it's got a couple gals on it, a little bit of, I believe it's TTL logic, yeah, 74C, 404, and 165. Uh, this is just simply set up. I've got these kind of, these wire wrap, I used wire wrap headers here. To get some height, I used long pins, and the long pins just simply push down into the wire wrap socket. There's the standoffs, of course, you see here, and you could screw the board down in. Uh, so that was the way I chose to, uh, oh, I'm out of frame here. It was the way I chose to mount these little daughter cards. It was just, like I say, they were, it's a tall wire wrap socket and long 0.1 millimeter or 0.1 inch pin headers. Uh, there's another board here that I put together that has not been tested. And this is the, uh, uh, what does he call it, the disk I.O.? Oh, there's a name for this. Any, anyhow, it emulates uh, a mass storage. I believe it emulates like a floppy. Uh, same construction technique. Dip headers. Wire wrap sockets along the edge here. Plugs down in, screws into these standoffs that are soldered to the board. Uh, I know when I bought the kit, I believe I got all the chips, or the majority of them from Bob. I don't remember for sure. I know the uh, gals were pre-programmed from him, that's why they've got these nice labels on him. On them. The EEPROM, well it's a plastic package. The ROM was uh, pre-programmed. Uh, I don't remember how much I supplied myself. 
I used all machine pin sockets for everything, which Bob highly recommended, and I do too for something like this. They're a lot more expensive at times. I just think it makes for a better build. Uh, looks like there's one actually standard socket here for this Dallas real time clock. Uh, there's a Max 232 on here, which I'm assuming is providing a serial port here, which is interesting. Uh, and of course the expansion connector comes off this that you could uh, put other boards on. So I think how I'm going to progress here is probably remove all the ICs, do an initial power on, check the voltage rail, uh, touch up all the solder joints, and then I'll work my way through Bob's manual for putting it back together. Yeah, sorry I'm not holding stuff in frame here. Uh, get a serial uh, monitor on it, uh, you know, just a uh, high, high or terror term probably on a PC, 2400 baud, I think it's N8 or 8N, and see if we can get this guy to come back to life, uh, or come to life. I don't think it ever completely powered up the first time. Anyhow, with that said, I guess I will finish getting my game plan together and we'll proceed. So I'm taking ESD precautions here. I do have my little grounding strip on. I'm on an ESD surface and I've got a piece of static foam. This is probably overkill, but I'm going to go ahead and take the precautions anyway. The other reason to transfer the chips into the foam is it helps protect, or protect the pins. I've got a uh, WIA chip lifter tool. It's got this nice little curved end here. So you can see that. It makes it easier to get up under the chip and pop it out. I've also got a husky pick here that sometimes works as well. You can get up under a chip. And I'm just going to walk through here and leverage all the chips up out of place. I'm actually going to kind of position them in the foam approximately where they are on the board. These TIL311 displays are somewhat fragile. The pins are somewhat fragile and can be broken off. They're also pretty spendy when you can find them on eBay or through like UT Source. I've got a fair number of them here. I got lucky in getting a number of them, fairly inexpensive, uh, ages ago. Uh, they were supposedly new old stock, but they were obviously used. Uh, when I got them, and there was a couple that didn't work, but there was enough that did work that uh, it was it was worth the money. Hopefully, you can see here that the chip lifter tool makes pretty easy work of this. Now I'm getting a lot of excessive angle on that that I really don't want to have. That starts to bend leads. Trying to make sure I've got stuff in frame here. And again, the idea of kind of replicating the position of the chips in the foam is it'll make it a little easier to put back together. And it'll also give me a hint as I'm troubleshooting if I had a chip in the wrong spot or perhaps perhaps the wrong orientation. It would make it a little easier to know. Uh, that was the potential mistake I made. Okay, I thought I used uh, machine pin sockets everywhere, but it's obvious I actually didn't. So I didn't do quite as nice a build with this as I thought I had, but that's okay. These are at least double wipe sockets. Double wipe means that they wipe on both sides of the pin, so the, the metal inside of there is U-shaped. Uh, the idea with this socket is to get what's called a, a, an, an airtight connection, and that is there's no air, no oxygen between the pin and where it pushes against the, the lead pin. Uh, oxygen causes oxidization and will cause reliability issues over time. So you actually want your socket to be pretty tight. 
sometimes this other tool is a little easier to work in here. Oh, I don't like the sound of that. That might require some help from a small flat screwdriver if I've got one laying here someplace. Which, of course, at the moment I don't. No matter how many tools you have, it is never enough. That's not going to work in there. Why don't I have a little flat screwdriver laying here? I have everything else imaginable. Well, it's been placed who knows where. I'll keep working this up out. See about getting a little deeper leverage in there. There's one side up. There it is. And the other side up. I say it's been at least a decade ago that I did the initial build on this. And then it just kind of fell into a box and never got back to it. I, uh, I was thinking about selling it. I actually put a, a note up on uh, the Spare Time Gizmos group probably eight, ten months ago to sell it and had some interest. And then uh, just never uh, completed the transaction with anybody. It just kind of it fell apart. And I feel kind of bad trying to sell something that has not worked since it was assembled. Uh, although somebody else might have a lot of fun. Trying to debug it, it's always difficult, or more difficult, to debug somebody else's build. So we've somewhat replicated the position of all the devices in the foam. All of the uh, semiconductors except the voltage regulator have been pulled off and this little transistor here up front. I have no idea if this backup battery is any good. I would suspect not. Uh, odds are really good it's dead by now. And I should just go ahead and remove it. If I can get it to pop out of there. A little bit tricky with that standoff right there. comes out. I'm sure at this point that little button cell is very dead. So we're down to the core of the board. I really can see that I kludged in a power switch here. It, it's the right width but it doesn't have 90 degree bent pins and I've got little jumper wires in there and a really lousy little strap over the top soldered in place. I will look for an appropriate replacement and do a better job of that switch. But really the first thing here I think is to uh, I'm debating get some power applied to it and just check out the voltage regulator Kind of disappointed I didn't use machine pin sockets everywhere, but this must have been must have been what I had in stock at the time. I know I didn't buy a complete kit. I know I supplied some amount of the components myself. I just can't tell you it's been so long what I did or didn't buy from Bob. Uh, anyhow, let me figure out how to get power on this thing next, and we'll go from there. So it's just a quick kludge to get power onto the board. I've just taken a, a in this case a 0.2 microfarad disc cap and I've tacked it across this set of pins here and that happens to be the barrel pin on this connector and the system ground and that way I can just clip onto the ground here and bring plus 9 in here. Uh, I don't have any jacks I can get at the moment that would fit this plug. So this was the best solution I could come up with. Uh, just working quick and dirty and I'm just simply going to take 
a set of leads from uh, my Rigol power supply. And I'm going to clip them on here. And I'm going to fire up the voltmeter. I'm going to set the current limit on the power supply to uh, 100 milliamps at this point. I don't expect that kind of draw just because there's really nothing active on here. And we'll turn the power on and take one of the sockets where there was a TTL device and just make sure there's 5 volts. And there's actually not. Interesting. Oh, I don't have the power supply output on there. Power supply is now providing 9 volts. We've got 4.990 volts out of the regulator. So we do appear to be what we do appear to have a regulated 9 volt power supply. Uh, the next thing I remember in this troubleshooting was to look at the output of the oscillator here. It's a 3.179 megahertz color burst crystal. Uh, you use that frequency if you're going to use the video chip here. That gets divided by 2 down to 1.78 for the 1802. We'll take a look at that next and just make sure that oscillator is running. And then I will go from there. So with all the chips out of the board and power applied, I wanted to look at the output of that uh, CAN oscillator, the 3.579, 3.58 megahertz, that color burst crystal oscillator. And so there it is at the scope. You can see that the frequency is at 3.577, 3.58. It, it's in that range. Voltage peak to peak. It's actually measuring 5.9 there, but that's because of the ringing. Uh, it's not really that high. If we look at the core signal, it's sweeping from around ground to 4.7 volts or so. Uh, you can see on the auto cursors here that it's, of course, detecting uh, the highs and lows of the ringing. Anyhow, we know that the 5 volt rail, I believe, looks good. Uh, let's see if I can get on the 5 volt. Not that it's going to do me any good here. So there's the 5 volt DC rail. Not that this is going to tell me a whole lot here. A little bit of noise on it, but you know, we've looked at the at the main power supply rail. We've looked at the first output of the clock here on the board. So we've taken a look at this can right here. And we know that it's oscillating, so you know the first couple of steps to take I've done. So we'll proceed now uh, with troubleshooting. I've got to go find the schematics. Uh, they're not in the three ring binder that I've got all the other documents in, so obviously I removed them at some point to troubleshoot or something. I just don't remember. Anyhow, I'll be back. So with this knowing that the uh, 3.58 megahertz output of that oscillator is running. That oscillator feeds into a 74 HC74 uh, flip-flop here that's set up to, as a divide by two to drive the 1.78 megahertz clock in. So what I'm going to do next is put that 7474 back into its socket, and that should be this guy right here, which it is. So I'll get him down to, into his socket. And he's in his socket. Pin one's the correct orientation. And according to the schematic, um, the manual, that should feed pin one of the uh, 1802 socket. So I've got the scope fired up here. I'll apply power and we'll get on pin one here and look for a clock. And what I'm seeing is 1.79 megahertz. Uh, and it looks like a, a decent clock. It's swinging from It's a good 5 volt TTL clock, essentially. There's, of course, ringing and stuff on it, but that, that tells me at least that point the circuit is working. At this point, I will fall back into following Bob's instructions in the manual that have you put certain uh, chips in, look at system operating current. Uh, at this point, we're drawing uh, n about 9 milliamps, is all, which makes sense. There's not a lot going on here looking at the supply. So this isn't like there's you know too much current being drawn already. 
something catastrophically wrong. You know, I'm debating here in my head again whether just retouching all these solder joints and just making the effort to go through the board and make sure they're all gone or all good before I go any further and I think I'm probably going to go ahead and do that. So I've continued to work through the manual kind of reading on how to bring the board up. Uh, I've noticed a couple of things. So I've gone through and checked the jumpers. Uh, these three jumpers up here were for the, having the 1861 in place which I'm not going to bring it up with. So those jumpers have been removed. Uh, JP5 was required and I think on the printed circuit board it's actually connected together. That's for the CE processor but I put a yellow jumper on it anyhow just to make it nice and visually clear it was required and then as I read there's the external uh, switch assembly connector here on the bottom and there's two pins on it that need to be grounded and that's pin 4 and pin 8 and those were not grounded on this and reading the manual that could keep it from running. He says it might run with those floating but to go ahead and ground them. I've checked the schematic. Uh, those pins come up to the 4044 here on pin 3 and pin 7. Jumping those to ground have grounded those two pins. So I know I've taken care of that step. Uh, the other thing I've done is I'm not going to put the 1210 low power SRAM controller in. And per his instructions, you take pin 1 and jump it to pin 8, and pin 5 and jump it to pin 6. And that disables the battery backup and the uh, low power SRAM controller. So, uh, it's possible that was causing me issues with the SRAM I had in here. It's not a low power 6256. It's just a standard one. As you said, it you know in backup it would drain this battery in a, you know a very short period of time. So I'm going to bring it up without that chip in place. Uh, this jumper's uh, VCC directly to the 6265 or the 6256, and this takes care of the chip select coming directly through to it, so that the low power controller is out of the way. Uh, there's a couple other jumpers on here I looked at quick. JP4. Uh, on here, I don't remember where it is. JP4 is right here. If it's in place, it'll start execution out of the EEPROM at address hex 8000, which is what I want because we want it to come up on the serial monitor. So that's in place. Uh, I am left questioning whether I have the right line driver here for the serial driver. The part number doesn't match what he calls out, but I'll, I'll find out. Uh, anyhow, the next step for the manual is to, we've done this, make sure with no ICs in that the, the power draws essentially zero. With the oscillator and the 74, uh, 74 in here, I think it's a, yeah, it was drawn 9 milliamps, which is fine. So there's no dead shorts, there's no short of capacitors. Uh, there's a filter cap sitting up here and another cap. Those aren't in backwards or leaking. Uh, next step is to go through and install all, all ICs except the 1802 and the 1861. So all the ICs except the processor and this guy going. I don't have this one so I won't be installing it. And leave out the uh, TIL 311 displays. So I'm going to put all that stuff in place and we'll bring it up uh, and then read his notes to move forward. So at this stage, I've got all the ICs in, uh, with the exception of the TIL-311 displays, uh, the 1802, and of course the video chip that I don't have. Uh, install the TTL oscillator is in, the 22V10 gal is in, turn on the power and check the power consumption. It should be less than 100 milliamps. Supply set to 9 volts, it's at 100 milliamps compliance, the output is on, so let me turn the power on. And that's actually a positive sign. So what he says here is the Q, SC0, SC1 LEDs may or may not light, or they may grow, uh, grow faintly. Don't worry about this. If you have access to a oscilloscope, check that pin 1 has the square wave on it. We'll go ahead and check that again just to make sure we're getting a good clock. Hopefully I can get on ground here and not short out the power supply. back around to pin 1 and I've got that 1.79 megahertz oscillator running there. That's a good sign. Uh, I'm assuming the run LED on is probably because I think runs jumper to ground on the header there. I could be wrong. And power draw at this point 630 milliamps. Well under or uh, 
take that back 70 milliamps I'm, I'm reading uh, the, the Watty scale here it's drawn about 70 milliamps at this point at 9 volts so it's within the 100 milliamps that he called out here the LEDs make sense so turn the power off I'm going to disable the power supply as well so I can actually put it back on install the 1802 I guess I'll do that here with the camera on because the pins were previously uh, set to width I shouldn't have too much trouble getting him in the socket and again I'm working on an ESD this bit of surface and you can probably see I put my ground strap back on just to be absolutely sure so uh, the 1802 is in turn the power off install and if you have it turn on the power and check the milliamp power consumption should still be 100 milliamps okay so let's bring the power back up uh, this isn't such a good sign turn the power off so let's see it's drawn at this point only about 30 milliamps which is interesting turn the power on and check the milliamp should still be under 100 milliamps and probably more like 50 to 75. Ensure that the run and load switches are both set to off and only the SC0 LED should be illuminated. Flip the load switch on and the green load LED should light. I don't really have the switch here to flip on. So the run LED is on and this is hard coded to uh, wake up in the wrong monitor and just run. So his description here is for having the keyboard on the front. And I don't think it directly applies because we're coming up in pure run mode. We've got the JP4 jumper in. It should be jumping to address 8000 hex into the ROM here. And it should be coming up and running the serial monitor. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn the power back off. And the next step here is to install the TL311s. I said before these are somewhat delicate once a pin on these gets bent uh, it becomes very weak and it's hard to not break it off uh, last I knew these were very spendy on eBay uh, in the dollars the tens of dollars a piece I think I mentioned before I managed to get a nice little batch of them that was supposedly new old stock that actually were pools with a couple of bad ones but they were in such good shape overall uh, I didn't feel ripped off by the eBay vendor as the majority of them worked were nice and bright and worked well so and I don't know if these are from that batch or just others I've randomly collected over the years um, TL 311 is interesting and that I don't know if you can see it here you probably can't there's a double notch up here on top I guess you can kind of catch it there. There's a double notch for the top rather than like a single notch in an IC, but that double notch is the top. So there's the TL311s in. So this should, go, the power supply should go into compliance at this point. It's only set to 100 milliamps limit. I'll, I'll enable the supply and it should hit compliance and it does. And you can see these are just trying to light up. A few of the LEDs have come up. So let me bring the current compliance up to 800 milliamps. And I don't know if you saw it or not, but I, I, I'm now confident we're running. Uh, hopefully the camera can catch us. When I first powered up, we'll see them reset. Then after a short period of time, we'll see the system start to run. There's the reset and run. So you'll see it come up in all zeros. And if you watch, it'll jump to 98 over here, and the addresses are moving. So you can see there's activity on the address lines. Uh, and it went to FC10 and hauled it. That's interesting. Was that just me? Creating noise? Nope. It got back to that same place and hauled it. So I don't know if it's sitting here waiting for input or not but I, I, that's a good sign the processor groups at least trying to run it gets to some point 
and the display is quit updating and it may now be like it's initialized the serial monitor and it's waiting for uh, serial IO but that's a good sign I think we have the board running at this point uh, the odds are fairly good maybe the mistake I made before was either not adding the jumpers down here but I hope that was all in camera was either not adding the jumpers down here to uh, ground those two pins out or perhaps the uh, uh, low power SRAM controller up here either wasn't working correctly which has been removed no it initializes the same it does a bunch of activity there and just stops at address FC 10 uh, opcode 16 and I'm guessing it's trying to do something on the uh, serial monitor or the, or the serial port at that point we'll find out But it's acting as I, I expect here. Uh, a little better centering here. You'll see a little bit of lag from me clicking it on to the run LED come on. Uh, according to the notes, it's about 300 milliseconds, three tenths of a second. And it's probably pretty close to that looking at it. Address bus is doing something, there's addresses moving, and then that uh, FC10. Again, don't know if that's normal or not, but I'm guessing it is. So that's a nice sign. Uh, I didn't actually look at the power draw. 610 milliamps. 580 when it gets to the halt. Because the, the displays aren't... Well, I'm going to call it a halt. I'm not sure. So 610 was the highest I saw. And right now it's idling at... Yeah, 600, 610, there's a little, it's very consistent, so it resets to 600, it gets to some point, does a jump to 610, and then 570, 580, when it goes into this quiet state here, so I'm satisfied with this, that we have definite progress on seeing this little guy come back to life. Uh, So the last thing he said to check, and we'll go ahead and do this, is just make sure the power supply isn't sagging under full load. Uh, of course, finding a ground here is difficult. I'm on volts. Measuring 4.981. It's nice and consistent. So, voltage regulator is doing its job. We're within uh, 20 millivolts of 5 volts, well, well within spec. It, the uh, regulator voltage didn't move through that, which is a good sign. So, I'm confident the little voltage regulator at least is okay. You know, thermally, uh, you know, it's drawn. 600 milliamps and there's 9 volts coming in so it's dissipating uh, 4 volts at 600 milliamps so what's that 2.4 watts so it's going to get warm uh, not dramatically warm but it will get warm uh, anyhow let me move on and see if we can figure out what the next steps are here to uh, get some life in this guy so at this point I've got my trusty laptop out I've got a USB RS-232 adapter here, plugged in, uh, it installed as COM3, TerraTerm is connected to COM3. We'll just plug it directly on here and see if we get lucky. So, bring the power supply up and we'll see if we get anything that appears to be serial monitor data. Which is now looking rather doubtful. Nothing. So that's not a good sign. There's several things this could be from this chip here being the wrong chip for the level translation uh, to the system just not working. So just verify settings here. Uh, setup. Serial port COM3 2400 8N, which is correct. Oh, wow, it needed me to hit enter. Hopefully you saw that. 
Uh, Cosmic Self 2000, EEPROM U87, check some 7666132K contents okay. We're actually in the monitor, so it actually is running. Let me uh, bump the font up here. I think it's a little easier for you to read. Uh, I don't know, 14 is going to be big enough. Actually, I want to go hard, hard, larger than that. Setup, font. See if we can get something nice and large, like on Carrier New. Anyhow, we actually have the monitor up and running. Let me try that again. There's a full reset. Don't know why it needed that enter the first time to come up. But there it is. We have a running ELF 2000 at this point, talking through the uh, serial port. So that's nice progress. I think the odds are really good. What I had missed before was simply the two jumper wires I had to add down here on the bottom of the board because I don't have the keyboard unit on it. Uh, that's probably why this didn't appear to be working before. So what can we do in the monitor? I guess that's the next big burning question. I don't honestly know. Uh, so let me kind of look through the manual here. Monitor command reference. We're not going to do boot. We can type basic, it looks like. Oops. Uh, it wants to know new or old. Oh, that's rather new or old program. We're going to create a new program. There's the prompt. It's going to go be a little bit tricky to type on here, but let's see if I can just write a quick and simple program. It's hard to type. This is even quicker tomorrow. 0 to 255, 10, print. I always have to do hello world. 15, next, X, error 2, and it's scrolled off the bottom of the screen. Let me bring the font back down little bit. 22 is a little too big. Rub? How about run? So it only wants uppercase commands for x equals, let's just do this, new, 10, oh man, hard typing even more sideways than normal print. If the basic is sophisticated enough to do this or not. Oh, go to 10. Well, there's a nice simple basic program running, just printing the hello world. So, oh, I'm going to bump the font up to something larger. Well, glad you could come along on this part of the journey with me. Uh, it's been nice to see this thing actually come to life. I do remember enough to know it wasn't working originally. Uh, 
looks like quite probably those two missing jumpers on the external uh, switch assembly adapter. Uh, I'm going to move on to next, seeing if we can get video out of this uh, uh, Pixie 1B board here, see if we can actually get some composite video out, which would be interesting. And move on and see if we can get the uh, this system here to work. Uh, I believe this has got a, a, a small OS that allows you to essentially save files, write files, that kind of stuff. I'm not totally sure. Uh, but we'll move on to those next. So anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this short video, and we'll talk soon. Bye.